Second to last brown bag will be given, will be given by Dr. Lisa Lucero, who is well known um, on campus and in, across the Americas for studies of complexity, water management, uh, Maya cosmology, and um, something that is close to Tom Emerson's heart, Maya ontology. <laughs> <laughs> and she's here to talk to us today about her latest field work and incorporating, uh, I think, updating us on how this is going to change all of our minds about uh, world history. <laughs> so with that, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you all for inviting me to participate, uh, to give a talk in this series. I really appreciate it. I've attended several myself, so this is very exciting. Um, let's see if I turn this. Okay. All right. Um, I walk and talk a lot, but I just want to give you an outline here of what I'll be talking about, the, just a general introduction to the classic Maya. Um, and, and what I define as the cosmology of conservation, which is based on an article that just came out three weeks ago. Um, and the materiality of a cosmocentric worldview, which is, of course, I define. And then I give uh, the case study is the portals and the significance of the absence illustrated at uh, Carablanca in Belize. So um, just a general idea here is the location of the Maya area. And this is the southern Maya lowlands. And these are where the famous or well-known sites are, like Tikal and Naranjo and these kinds. And here's Carablanca, where I work in Saturday Creek and Yalbach. And it's, a, it's, it's a, based on a whole karstic limestone. Uh, it's a karstic topography, so there's a lot of openings, caves, wet and dry. Right? So this sets the stage. And it's, a, it's hardwood forests, so in mahogany, cedar, rosewood, and these kinds of things. Ironically, this is a tropical area, the semi-tropics. Um, interestingly, and ironically, the, its surface water can be relatively limited because it's karstic and it's very porous. So you have lots of rain, but a lot of it percolates through the limestone, okay? especially in the interior zone here. Okay. And there are bajos, which are seasonal wetlands or seasonal swamps, but they're mostly during the rainy season. And there are hundreds of centers, not all of them are out here, of course, and, and there are hundreds of kings. Not every center has a king, but most of them do. There's not one overarching king or emperor. So those are the basics. And then to appreciate the Maya, you have to appreciate what they didn't have access to. No visa burden, no wheeled carts, no extensive roads. LIDAR's exposing more, but not to the extent elsewhere. No metals, no extensive irrigation systems. They emphasized labor over technology. I mean, they're technologically sophisticated. But when it came down to it, it was labor intensive. And they are rainfall dependent. Because of the lack of massive irrigation systems, they are rainfall dependent. Just like the farmers are in the Illinois Midwest. Which is why I, there's a lot of similarities when I read the reports in the newspaper about um, farmers in the area. <coughs> Excuse me. They're, it's a hierarchical society, so each center has a ruler, and there's nobles and aristocrats and artisans, and here's the 98 percenters, the farmers and laborers. And the height of population and power and everything was in the late classic period, between about 550 and 850 CE. Now, a, a tropical area, it's green, it's verdant, it's beautiful, it's vibrant. And, but water is still a critical feature um, because you have hurricanes and tropical storms, too much, not enough, the dry season, um, where it becomes a, dry, a green desert. If you do not know where to find water, you could die of dehydration. Um, and then water quality issues in terms of you know waterborne diseases, you know all of the tropical diseases you probably are familiar with, and as well as you know keeping in mind the daily needs of water, you know, of course drinking, but cooking, ceramic and plastic manufacture, etc. So I'm setting the stage. Setting the stage. So what you have are these two extreme seasons. It's about seven months rainy season and about five months dry. And this is the same spot, more or less, in the same place in the Belize River. Now, thankfully, there's a bridge. Before, there was a ferry where an old guy had to crank us across. We drive up our trucks on here. But during the height of the dry season, the water is low and murky and dirty. And then, but the ferry, wasn't, the ferry guy wasn't necessary because it was so low, the ferry became a bridge. But in the rainy season, there's so much debris, the ferry becomes worthless, unusable. So you have these extremes. So the Maya dealt with two landscapes, the wet and the dry. 
And as archaeologists, we are, our ideas, our models sometimes are biased towards the dry season because that's where when we work. Um, and so what you have are these two forces, the centrifugal and centripetal forces, in terms of Maya centers, these urban Maya centers. Um, I mean, this is a LIDAR map of Caracol, Belize, um, and you have all these terraces, which is unique to Caracol. Every center, just like every Midwestern town like the side of Champaign, it has the same features, but it has something unique about it, very unique aspects. Here, there, the hillsides are just terraced, and there are road systems connecting different neighborhoods and smaller centers and so on. They're, they're dispersed. All of these little dots here are residential units, residential compounds, and they're spread all over because the fertile soils are dispersed, and thus you get dispersed farmsteads. And you get both extensive and intensive agriculture based on where you're located. In this case, you have intensive. Um, aguadas, natural sinkholes, uh, these are the roadways, sock bale, low density of urbanism, in other words. And there's varied scales of water and agricultural systems. Sometimes they're the size of this room, and sometimes they're the size of the entire campus, if not larger. Um, now, the rainy season is the, uh, the height of the agricultural intensive period. And that's when everyone has plentiful water. So you have dispersed, dispersed farmers, plentiful water working in their fields, uh, mirroring the dispersed nature of the soils. Okay. Now, the dry season, in a lot of these areas with the largest, most powerful Maya centers, like Kalafo and Tikal, they have the most powerful kings and the highest number of people, 50 to 80,000 plus people were supported. Okay. Now, interestingly, these areas are located in areas with large amounts of great fertile soils, but no surface water, no lakes, no rivers. So what they did was they built these massive reservoir systems that are located next to temples. I call them toll booths. You want access to the water? You give us your labor, your food, your services, etc. So it's integrative because you have, and during the dry season, when farmers dispersed with great agricultural land but not a lot of surface water come to these centers be attracted by reservoirs, public events, massive, you know, ball games, large markets in public squares, and so on. And that's why we call them centers rather than cities, per se. I mean, they're urban, but they're urban centers rather than urban cities because most of the monuments architecture is for this integrative purposes, to bring people in. Yes, yeah, so and that's sort of a simplification and it, you know, uh, kind of thing. But, but basically, you need water during the dry season. That's the agricultural downtime. And that's when you would build and maintain buildings. You can't do it in the rainy season. All right? So you have all this stuff going on. So there's all this activity going on. Okay? So you have these, these multiple forces pulling people back and forth due to the pulses of the agricultural and the rainy and the wet and dry seasons. So there's all this movement going on. But my centers in the Southern Maya Lowlands, hundreds, were abandoned by the early 1900s. And increasingly evidence there's from speleothems and sediment cores, um, increasingly shows that there were several, 8 to 13, um, long droughts okay, between this period. And what it did, is, this is not environmentally or climate deterministic per se, but what it did was set in motion events that ultimately, ultimately resulted in an urban diaspora where people just like, bye. There's not a lot of evidence for violence. There's a few centers that show violence, but a small percentage. Most is just like, we're voting with our feet. Goodbye. You failed as water managers. You failed in providing this clean water. You failed in this. You failed in that. We're just leaving. We're not voting for you again. Okay. Um, now, it was bad enough where people did have to leave communities. You know, about, uh, some people suggest about 90% of the population left the area. You know, they became climate refugees. That quickly renegotiated uh, their relations with other Maya and other areas. They went north, south, east, and west. And you see this plethora of this growth, like you get the fluorescence of Chichen Itza and the northern lowlands and other northern lowland centers, which has a different history. That's another story altogether, which I don't have time to talk about. But also, a lot of people say it can't just be climate because it took 100 years between this period for different centers to lose power for the people to leave. I'm like, well, with several multi-year multi droughts and the fact that every center had their own issues, their own problems, you know, of course it's going to take a long time period. Okay. So that's setting the stage. You know, it's basic, but 
right? Now, so kings disappeared, but people persevered. And I have permission to use this photo from the Trump family and use their real name. Cleofo has been with me a long time. But there are 7 million Maya living today in Central America and beyond. There's a community here in Champaign, or Urbana. And it speaks to their sustainable way of life. Okay, how? I argue that it's a worldview that guided their daily existence and engagement with the non-human world. And that means everything non-human. So let me explain. After a shot of coffee. Mm. Um, And if you're interested in reading the article, just email me. I'll send you a PDF of the article. So this is a, an outline. That these are some of the main concepts that I'll be talking about. So in general, it's found in many or several non-industrial, um, non-Western societies. It varies, of course. But I call it a cosmology of conservation. But in general, it's defined, as Descola would say, as a cosmocentric worldview. And it situates objects, humans, people, land, water, everything in an analogistic manner. I don't, I'm not going to say equal, but everyone plays their part. Everyone is animated. Everyone has a soul, actually, or some kind of animation. You know, It's hard to define using our limited vocabulary, honestly. Um, so each plays a role in maintaining their place in the world and the world itself. Right? So this is in direct contrast to a Western Cartesian <coughs> dichotomous and linear um, anthropocentric worldview that attempts to keep nature out or control it. And it's the opposite of a religion of progress, which is basically what we're living in now. We must make more money, we must build, we must expand, we must progress. Um, and so I, 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 I basically, I argued that they were one with world rather than one with nature. I say that because, well, I'll explain it in the next slide. So, but this relationship required continual acknowledgement engagement via ceremonies and other kinds of daily existence just daily living. And this is illustrated in their language. For example, there's no term for, for nature. There's no separation of nature and culture. Okay? There's no term for religion, because it's a daily way of, of life living. It's a, an appropriate way. And just always keep in mind, though, that our terminology, you know, the translations are rough, because we don't have the words to express a lot of these ideas. So just keep in mind, please. So, so like they, uh, you know, to enter God, or uh, a, a sacred, righteous way of life. You know, these are their best, you know, approximations, not mine, of course. And also, the, the ergative nature of my languages, where um, there's a plurality of subjects. So, in, in many my languages, if not most, they de-emphasize I and focus on we. But the we includes clouds, plants, rivers, mountains, and animals, etc. So, and this is a quote, I just love it. Native Americans often refer to the sun, mountains, clouds, rain, and so forth, in ten terms. I think it goes back to this cosmocentric worldview um, that many non-industrial societies have before the Renaissance, before the divorce of nature and culture occurred. And also the Maya had a circular way of thinking. We, had, we think in a linear manner, past, present, and future, linear. They have a cyclical. It's like a spiral. I don't want to imply moving forward, but it's moving, spiral. It's just moving. So, um, so death is not the end, but the beginning, because there's a continual recycling of souls, which I, which I said before, everything, everybody has. So it's a continual, you know, so the vessels change, but there's a continuity. And this is reflected in everything in the physical world, including humans or, or you know, um, okay. So everything is animated, has a soul, and it's what's more significant than the bodies or things interacting with each other is that the souls are interacting with one another. And a lot of this stuff is based on ethnographic examples as well. So I just don't want to have tons of references put in. But it's all in the article if you want. Interact with other souls connected. So everything is connected because everything becomes a soul. Okay. Not necessarily related, but connected. Um, and again, everyone and everything plays a part. It's not always a perfect relationship. And just briefly, at El Mirador, it's a massive, massive site in the Botanic Guatemala. It has one of the largest temples. It's about the largest new world structure. But it was, this center was an early experiment in massive water management system and, and, and monumental building construction. It was abandoned by 150 CE. Okay. Because they're plaster floors. To, re, to make plaster, you have to burn wood and, and burn to, to uh, break down lime into to calcium carbonate, becomes calcium oxide, and you mix it with sand and, and water, becomes a plaster. But their plaster uh, 
floor for like 10 centimeters throughout. You don't need to do it that thick. But there's denuding of the landscape. They were silting in of reservoir systems. So they abandoned it. There's other factors going on. But they didn't make that mistake, mistake again. They renegotiated, if you will, because they didn't abandon my centers for another 700 years. Okay, so they learned from their mistakes. Okay. So the world of it, I got this off the web, I don't, I forgot that. But it's a merged world, this connected, merged world. Um, and it's circular. It's, it's also divided into um, four sections, or what's fifth in the center. And again, there's no separation of nature and culture, natural and supernatural, sacred, secular. It's all one. Okay. And oh, you don't have time to discuss the significance of the different colors, um, the cardinal directions, and, and the upper world and lower world per se. But uh, there's a lot of cyclical, integrated, merged worlds going on here. And it's reflected in the materiality, the material, materiality of this cosmocentric worldview is reflected in every single artifact we recover, every one. For example, this is a nice one. This is a dish, and it's showing um, the story of their origin story, uh, called, uh, or, or the most recent one written down in the 1600s, the Popol Vuh, post-conquest, but still. So here's the watery underworld here, the water lily pads reflected, represented by water lily pads, and the earth is a carapace, often it's a turtle or, or crocodile. And then what is emerging is Maze, the Maze God. He had been captured and killed by the Death Lords in the underworld, and it shows his reemergence, the Maze God. And his hero, his tw the hero twins are pouring water to nourish, to allow him to grow. And the thing is, this, even though it's about a God being reborn, renewed, it's the same thing for Maze that breaks through the earth. You add water and it breaks through the earth. The same for humans being nourished. You know, it's the same with everything. So this plate is very reflective of more than just what it depicts here. Now notice it has a kill hole. Because everything in um, the Maya world, before it started a different path on its life history, had to be deanimated in its old life history. So here, notice it shows you swear. So it was a serving dish that was used. So before it became a cache, it had to be killed as a, a, a serving dish before it, it, be, it could become a dedicatory cache. Now some vessels are pristine and don't have any evidence of killing or termination because they were produced specifically for that context. Okay. So pristine stuff, you know, uh, so anyway. So, but it's cyclical. It started its life anew. Death and renewal, death begets life. Okay. Another way, the term vitz is a Mayan word that represents temple and lineage mountain. Now, sometimes in the literature you'll see that pyramid temples are a replica, but I'm saying, and just based on you know my argument, it's not representing a replica, or it's not a replica. It is a vitz. It is a mountain. They don't have you know, the description in the hieroglyphs about a replica of a, of a mountain, a lineage mountain. They just say bits. It's a bits. And it has cave openings like karstic topography, a lot of portals, a lot of openings. It's the same. Nine terraces, there's nine, uh, before it used to be levels, but there's nine sections in the underworld, and so a lot of temples have nine terraces. I can go on and on, but I won't. But so it is, but it's not one until the appropriate ceremonies and offerings and appropriate behavior or um, completed. So a, a house, same thing with house. A house does not become a home until dedicatory offerings and, and the rites and rituals, until it is absorbed back into the world. Another example is, th these are two, this is a minor center I, I excavated that was occupied, we found earlier ceramics, but for now, 600 BCE through 1500, right? Tikal. This is a massive regional capital. This is a North Acropolis. This is a, uh, they excavated it in the 60s, UPenn and the Guatemalan government. But it has the same depositional history. We see stratigraphy, but it's a cyclical. You know, so they have dedicatory funeral rites, termination, uh, or, or excuse me, funerary termination, dedicatory funeral, dedication, uh, termination, dedicatory. So we see straight up, but it's representing this renewal that, you know, renewal and continuously. 
But my, my point is here, here there's small labor pools. I put them to the same scale. So you can see the profile here is very small compared to here. But this shows, you know, this shows 2,100 years of occupation. But we're talking about small community labor pools versus massive amounts of labor you see here. But this started out as a six by six meter, one meter tall platform. But as, as the power and might grew, you get larger and larger labor parties and so on. But it still has dedicatory offering, and termination, and, and burials. All right? It's the same. And I could have added a teeny house, but it wouldn't have been visible. The same, my point is. Everything. Okay, so that's the materiality of it. So now I want to move on to illustrating how we can further explore different kinds of materiality of this cosmocentric worldview and by talking about Cara Blanca Belize, it's particularly portals and the significance of the absence. This shot was taken, um, you could see it's a cenote. I'll explain that, but I just love the shot. Okay, so portals, karstic topography, thousands and thousands of openings, some wet, some dry, some accessible, some not. Tons undiscovered, trust me. So up to, to Nicho Mugnal here, I'll just illustrate. Uh, there's been a lot of cave archaeology done. This is a wet and dry cave, but you can enter it. Um, Tim has gone. Anyone else gone to ATM? Up to Nicho Mugnal in Belize? It's, an it's transformative. People come out of there just transform. It's definitely. Uh, anyway, you have to swim to the entrance and raise yourself up on a ledge. No big deal. Um, but it's home to so portals or home to Chalk, the rain god, uh, other gods, ancestors. It's a means of communication. So, you know, it's um, other world, you know, lower, underworld, you know, there's, there's various names. It's also because mists come from mountains, thus the Maya think that rains and clouds come from mountains. So it's alive. And then in caves, you know, water exudes from the side. It's just alive, it's animated water flowing, everything is animated. And there's a lot of offerings. These aren't burials. These are not burials. There's no offerings. They're, they're not buried. And they're in areas that water would not explain where they are. There's a lot going on here. Um, that's another article altogether. But a lot of offerings, jars, food, water, to appreciate gods and ancestors for rain, or again, for rain to stop. Too much. Um, so a watery portal are, are cenotes, which are steep-sided sinkholes fed by groundwater. Okay? Again, home to chalk and pure water because it's exuding from the earth. It's been cleansed by the earth. Okay? Um, connected to the sea, etc. There are over 7,000 in the northern lowlands, but only a very small percentage um, explored. But many, there's many fewer in the southern lowlands because it's higher elevation, thus the groundwater the water level is much lower. Thus, you have many, many fewer cenotes. And you have a lot more dry caves, of course. So you have tons less dry caves in the northern lowlands. And this is an, a, a, a post-classic in the northern lowlands because there's been so much studied here. This is Chichen Itza, the sacred cenote. Um, this is how deep it is and everything. There's a shrine on the south side. Right. And in the early 1900s, um, an archaeologist dredged it. A lot of things were, but they, the stuff out of there was amazing. Also, like early items that had been inscribed with hieroglyphics dating to 300 years later, you know, so this heirloom kind of thing. And also human remains, uh, at least 70 individuals, mostly young adolescents. Um, gold, this is at, at the post classic period, gold came in from um, Central America and West Mexico. Beforehand, there was no metal. And it's, it, again, it's exported. But a lot of things in turquoise, this is all from the um, Chichen Itza, the blue sacred cenote. So they're making offerings to the portal and mean communicate, you know, propitiating or thanking or, or pleading or whatever. Okay. And Lake Amatitlan in Guatemala, um, this actually collection is at the Milwaukee Museum of Art. They funded it in the 60s. So anyway, the cool thing about this site is that it represents, the ceramics recovered represent 2,000 years and the ceramics, some of them come from central Mexico. So not only is it a long period for this making offerings, but also different ethnic groups. You know, which says something about, you know, communication, transportation, also 
the other the similar means of the, this cosmocentric worldview. Okay. And you know, Mercury, cinnabar, graphite. You know, this that's just this very unique. You know, I've got to go to Milwaukee one of these years and go to this see this. I don't know if they're on display, honestly. So here's Carablanca. Um, I'm, 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 I'm other publications, I talk about it as a pilgrimage destination, which I think we need another term for that. It's, it's, but still, it, it, for now, it serves a purpose. But with pilgrim sites worldwide, many sites are considered sacred, for lack of a better term. And so I argue that this promotes conservation because it allows animals and plants and stuff to flourish. Because oftentimes you can't hunt, you can't plant crops, you can't do anything other than engage with it and acknowledge it. And so, and because the journey is, is a very important part of pilgrimage. So there's a minimal footprint in such areas. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a type of forest management, which is another topic again. Um, so, so there's a lot of portals. So all of these numbers, there's 25. And Jean Larman in 2017 thinks we discovered, she discovered the, the 26th. Okay. Um, and it's called Carblanca because white face Carblanca. And we focus a lot of our efforts on pool one. You can barely see it. That's 100 meters across, just to give you an idea. How am I doing my time? OK, pretty good. So what we have, so these are the best soils. This is an, an idea of, a, to give you an idea of the dispersed nature of soils, which also reflects biodiversity as well. But anyway, these are these great class two soils, they're called. There's no alluvium in this particular area because there's not a lot of rivers. So this is it. So here, near lakes, you have denser residential settlement near lakes, but near these are cenotes, you have less dense but specialized structure near cenotes. So all the little dots near these cenotes in this area here are all ceremonial or non-residential. Okay. And so this is pool one. It's over 200 feet deep. And there's also an underwater cave, fossils, another story and hopefully offerings, but it's so massive. There's so many trees, because it's at the base of the cliff, trees have been falling in for thousands of years. It's just, it's sort of challenging. But we have hope, and I'll show you about that in a minute. So here, so there's two portals here. Now I, I did some research, in-depth research on Wikipedia, um, mm -hmm. to see how deep, deep sea divers go for pearls. And you know, so I don't know, I'd have to, you know, but they go up to 165 <coughs> feet. And so the top of this um, cave begins at 100 feet below the water surface. So I'm just curious if they might about it. But because they did spend a lot of their efforts at this site during a very um, specific time period. Okay, so here's a map. Here's, there's the various structures here. And we're going to talk about these one, three, and the sweat bath um, before I go on. So this is structure one, and the northeast section of the building has collapsed into the cenote. And so already here it's, you know, 40, 50 meters deep, and it gets deeper as you get closer to the cliff here, the cliff face here, right? And what you have is you have a passageway, and in the prior year, we had exposed the exterior, which is still under. So um, one of the things Jeannie Norman's going to do for his dissertation is actually um, stitch together different seasons so you get the whole um, temple exposed. But you have a, this narrow passage here that guides you to room two, where we found a lot of offerings. Okay. But it's terminal classic. It was terminated before everyone left during the urban diaspora because all other propitiations, all their pleading did not work. But what they did was they terminated it with tufa. Tufa is limestone, but it forms underwater. It, you know, calcium carbonate precipitates around things like branches and stuff that falls in. And so all of this is tufa. Here's a close-up, an example. You could see the branches have, you know, rotted away, and all these vesicle, you know, it's really cool. So they extracted from the pool to terminate the temple instead of using the plentiful surface cobbles and boulders. There's tons all over the place. But they purposely went into water. Okay. So again, you know, I don't need a hieroglyphic to tell me that this was a water temple or associated with water or rain or something. And there's blue chert and there's, it's, it's also what is absent. 
There's no agricultural tools, well, one tool. There's no matates, there's no this, there's no this. There's no small serving vessels, just massive vessels. Okay. I have a whole list of things. Then now I just want to emphasize a couple things. They dismantled the vaulted roof, the Corba vault. These are the, the, some of these are a meter long. Okay. And so the terminal classic between 800 and 900, and they, the things were becoming dire. They intruded into their minimal footprint philosophy and built um, this, this building. Okay. But they didn't, they didn't use it to build houses or canals. You could, you could actually extract water from the cenote or build agricultural terraces or anything. They did not. Even though there's nearby fertile soils and there's year-round water. I mean, I'm excavating the dry season, the end of the dry season. There's plenty of water, as you see. You don't have centers. You don't have dead settlement, period. Okay. Um, relatively few artifacts in the field. And then, but it's really labor intensive. I mean, nine centimeters thick, you don't even have that at many centers. You know? And then just, you know, major construction event. Very clean. No tufa. Or just a, a piece or two. Um, and then we found, usually in the Maya area, I did uh, my dissertation research on ceramic variability in households, uh, about 21 to 38% of the assemblage, uh, domestic assemblages are jars. Here, 75%. And not only that, they were pretty massive in scale. And, and also, they're from different, even though they look alike, these Kayo and Slipped, as they're called, all the rim treatments, they're all varied. A lot of, there's a lot of variety from different, there are different styles from different regions. Now, without Mesa Bird, how they got there, or, or if they made them locally, matching their um, home style, that's another story altogether. And I need to do petrographic analysis and that kind of thing. But anyway, um, so they all date to this time period. Water jars with finger-sized breaks, they were, they were killed with a kill hole. There's all these little scallops. I mean, they're all consistent. And I think they're thumb breaks. Because, oh yeah, we didn't find any complete vessels. None of them are complete. They're taking pieces away or throwing them in the water. Or burying them somewhere else. Because sometimes in caves, you find just the neck. Or you find just body surge. Okay. You do find complete vessels, but... So these different merging of different portals. And this is from the Madrid Codex, which dates the late post-classic. But Chalk and Chalk Chale Goddess are pouring water from a jar that represents the creation of rain or even a primordial flood. So jars, this mundane, you know, vessel, you know, serves all of these purposes depending on the context. So we go back to the labs, you know, put the jars in a different light. Or bubble. Okay, so, and also we had serving dishes from the Yucatan, uh, from the Bataan, from Eastern Belize, and the Belize, everywhere. Highly Guatemala, we're getting stuff from all over. Um, and just this uh, Jess, a former student, is showing the size of this. Okay. And this isn't the largest, you know, feasting. And uh, edible shells here. And then structure three is this long and narrow platform that was burn, 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 um, covered in smashed ceramics. And here's the cool part I mentioned. We found a step that's just like this big. And it's only a meter away from the edge. And so finally we found the place where they probably made offerings. Well, now I need to get more money for diving. If we can find it. There's a lot of slump, a lot of trees, and so on. But I can hope. And also there's we excavated a trench here. And there are all the fills date to the same time period. Late, late classic, trauma classic. So even though there's different strata all built in the same time period, this period of 100 years. Spending all this time and money. And on the surface, um, you know, there's almost 7,000 shirts. The majority were found smashed on the surface. None are complete. There's only a very small percentage of rims. So there, are they taking it as a keepsake? Are they throwing it in the water? Are they just throwing it in the trash? But none are complete. And they're very, very, you know, lots are charred themselves. And non-ceramic artifacts, 1.5% of the assemblage. Everything else is ceramics. And we also did trench, oops. Um, so there's Aaron, 
and Amy Carba, Aaron Benson. Um, we also found HR, and I'm calling them human caches because they don't have great roots. They're not sacrifices. You know, there's actually a, a disagreement about. I don't. From what I understand, the term sacrifice doesn't really exist. Um, Maya, and ethnographically and historically, carry around bundles of their ancestors, especially if they're moving to a new area. Or um, they could be uh, people just died there, or they could be um, somebody special, or, you know, until we were trying to get money to do DNA analysis and isotopic stuff, so a lot going on here. And there's a lot more going on this burial. There was a piece of a matate just squished up against his cheek. It looks like he was covered in rocks before he was, while he was defleshed. I mean, it was just so closely packed. A lot going on here. Um, in 2018, we just expected to find more of the same. So we expanded the trench south, so the water's over here. But we exposed an early, late classic platform here. And so I think during um, the, the pre-prolonged drought period is that people were coming and that there were some you know, shrines or something uh, that were used for perhaps thousands of, or years or hundreds <coughs> of years. But only during this period between 800 and 900 was when they really started to intensify their visits in this time of drought. And there's slightly different percentages, not as many jars, but I don't have time to talk about that. Um, Larman will write this up, and Jess Gonzalez, another graduate student, and Amy Copper, um, an undergraduate student. Okay, and so we've, we've also explored other pools. And um, and the more I was reading about uh, you know, ethnographies, the more I appreciate the fact of the path of the sun. Because the sun emerges in the east. That's associated with red and renewal. West is a death. Associated with death and black. And that's where the sun goes every night and dies. It doesn't, you know, disappear. It dies. And every morning it's reborn. And so many pilgrimage follow the path of the sun, so they go east to west. You know, whether they be in, 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 in towns today or in engaging with the forest or something else. They, you know, they follow the path of the sun. And it just so happens these pools are, are you know, aligned. Well, it just doesn't so happen, right? The gods did it. That it runs east-west. So, so we started to expand our explorations. And the cool thing about here because I really want to focus on the sweat bath, is that um, there was a small pyramid temple here. We started to excavate it. We trenched it. It was half cut stone and fill, and the other half was a natural knoll of limestone. They cut stairs into this knoll. So they merged. Talk about merged world. Yeah, here it's literal. And um, the sweat bath here, and I show this. That this was before the 2010 hurricane. Um, it's hard to see, but it's, a, it's one of the few true arches in, in the Maya world, okay? And so here's just the, based on, we excavated this in 2016, I did a field school. Looters just looted the hell of it, period, okay? Um, we just, there's a, a, a small corner with intact floors that, again, surround my stage to 800, 900. So in 2018, just a few more slides. Oh, it's just we have plenty of time for questions. Um, this is so cool. Okay, so at first, these I drew these in 2016, just doing a rough like, okay, since this was mapped in 2007 or 2006, I can't remember which, um, by Andrew McKella, that there's been more Buddhist trenches. So here's the sweat bath, just a rough idea. And so we started to, you know, so there's one meter thick walls, Vaulted architecture, perhaps, and heavily looted, yes, but the sweat bath. What I realized, it's like, where are the uh, walls? <laughs> Field mode, sorry. Where are the walls? I'm like, and then I'm like, wait a minute, there's no roof stone. There's no vaulted. I mean, everything else suggests vaulted architecture, you can tell. You know. And where are the debris, where are the piles of dirt and stone if we're looted? So it just came to me, probably were drinking, that they were dismantling this whole thing, except the sweat bath. 
that we left alone untouched until the frickin' looters came. Looting is still a major problem. I mean, the walls go nowhere. Look at that. They, it's just, yet what remains, there's massive meter thick walls. So, um, and then what they did was, there's a lack of large debris, cut stone suggests purposeful dismantling, and then on top there's like unusable features. Like this is not a plaster floor per se because it just crumbles. It looks like it's unfired limestone, like marl, basically. It's so soft, but it's really thick. I think 16 centimeters. How big is this little book? Seven inches. Whatever. You know, get the point. Okay? And then on top, originally in room one, here, I wanted to put a center trench in to get idea of the functions of this. Like, are these are, were they, did these house priests? Did these house um, the visitors? Did they house, were they making the ceramics? You know, here, I mean, we don't know, right? That's why you dig. So, and there are no walls. Just a massive pile of fill. One original wall remains. And on top of which, they put in an HR, incomplete, a bundle, um, all the ends are missing, or they were broken naturally. I, I guess there's a non agreement, but to me, they, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. Um, thick, soft plaster marl floors. HR on top of the boulder field room. I mean, there should have been a room, a wall here, a wall here, doorway here, wall here. It's a pile of stone. And there's other potential stops. Above this massive sinkhole in pool 15, there's a, what we're calling a shrine. And then here, there's a, a near pool 6. There's a residential compound, if you want to call it, or ceremonial, but it has a stela and altar, which are usually only found in centers. Okay. So again, you know, future explorations. But we're really, you know, Car Blanco has turned out to be a really cool place. Unfortunately, this whole area is being clear cut. This is now the southern border of what used to be a sustainable logging company and that's been doing it for 30 years that you don't see clearly. There's a lot of, you see a lot of stumps, but for every tree they cut, they plant four. The hurricane just damaged anyway, it's, it's really sad. Um, but there's a lot more going on here. So this is an example of, that's why I talked about the significance of the absent. You know, we define things based on how many buildings are there, what kind of evidence, what kind of, you know, assemblages we find. But it's also significant what is absent in terms of, um, you know, understanding how they engaged with. Because even in the dire period between 800 and 900, they did not, again, they did not build irrigation systems or canals or, or terraces. They did not build houses, you know. They, they built religious or ceremonial architecture. But by 900, this area was abandoned. There's some, uh, we want to test, um, uh, around the lakes to see if there's terminal classic, post classic, probably. Some people remain. So, just to sum up, um, during this time period, several prolonged droughts, you get intensified visits to these pilgrimage centers, uh, but not in the sense of domestic or agricultural purposes, uh, probably per, you know, via a ceremonial circuit, especially since they've lost faith in the kings and their path dependent ways, bad kings. <coughs> Um, they went back to the original Vits, their own ancestors, sacred water bodies, etc., as part of the urban diaspora. Okay. Before they left, though, they dismantled, deanimate what they had added. Because that perhaps they thought that was part of the problem, that they inserted too much in this special place. I don't know. Okay. So, a cognoscentric worldview is everything merged in a cyclical existence. You know, sky, upper world, earth, water, underworld. And that's the a temple one is just collapsing in. If we cleaned it up, you'd see architecture here. So Car Blanc is not empty, but vibrant and engaged, but with a minimal footprint. And this is contrasting to how we live today. We're all going to die. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, you know, since the Renaissance, uh, we've started this divorce of nature and culture, which is really sad. <clears throat> we need to get them to renew the vows. Because it has led, you know, to this idea, you know, that um, Francis Bacon wrote, 1620, that 
nature exists for the sole purpose of serving humans. Um, but that concept in the Protestant ethic and, and capitalism and, and you know just limitless growth in the religion of progress has resulted in what we are now living in the Anthropocene, an epic of our own making. That's not something to brag about. So I'm called, my call to arms is to get back some of this cosmocentric worldview to work with nature because throughout the world, I know there's other case studies, um, millennia of sustainable living. Thank you. <laughs>